Krista Morris, the author of um, The Auschwitz Tattooist, uh, a huge um, bestseller around the world, was, uh, uh, was uh, sold for over 3 million copies, maybe more. I can't keep track. It's like uh, get, getting bigger and bigger. Um, uh, and uh, Mati Kochavi and his daughter Maya Kochavi, who collaborated on a really innovative um, technology, uh, Instagram, uh, to, uh, br to share the story of a young 13-year-old um, uh, girl who was murdered uh, in Auschwitz. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, by the way, their Instagram reached hundreds of millions of, of people around the world. And okay, so now we will start. So my first question to you is the following. So millions of books, millions of movies, millions of any possible media thing was done on the Holocaust. Um, many of them reached some sort of success, but uh, this, what you guys succeeded to do is really um, um, uh, beyond this kind of success. And my question to you is the following, what do you think made it happen? And also, what was your personal motivation in, in the beginning? And whether this personal motivation you think contributed to the success? I will start with Heather. She's from Australia. She's sitting in her home in Australia. Yeah. The author of the tattooist of the Aus uh, tattooist from Auschwitz. Yes, Heather, please. Uh, look, hello, and thank you so much for this invite. I'm just delighted to be having this chat with everybody today. Well, for me, telling this story, I didn't have a choice. Once I met the man, I met Lolly Sokolov and got to know him and was in his life for three years, up until two hours before he died. He was part of my life. Of course, I had to tell his story. Now, why has this story resonated around the world? And why has it resonated with young people in particular? I wasn't sure that it would. I hoped it would. And we've been able to determine just why that has happened. Because in writing about Lully and Gita and Silke and the other people that involved in his story, I'm writing about young people, 16, 17, 18 year old young boys and girls. Lully was a bit older in his early 20s, but not the others. But also I'm telling the story from the perspective of one person. And uh, I know the story and the whole narrative of the Holocaust must be told in its totality of, of the millions of people. But by reducing it down to one person's story, we've discovered it becomes very relatable. So that is why we believe it has done so well. I have had nine-year-olds write to me, many, many teenagers. The book now is being produced in the UK and in Australia and New Zealand as a young adult book. And it's in the school curriculum in these countries. And I am now busy, well, no longer visiting schools. I'm having to do webinars and, and talks like this. But it, young people are getting it. And for many, it's the first time they hear that word, Holocaust. Matthew, what do you think? And Maya, Maya, why you start? I was just going to say that um, I really agree with Heather um, in that it's all about the individual story. If we find a character that a lot of people across the world can connect with and can resonate with and see part of themselves within that character, then the success lies there because they start to feel like that character is them. They start to feel a peer-to-peer -peer connection with that character. So um, in many ways, I agree with what Heather said. And so do you think that this is the success of Eva? I think part of the big success of Eva was Eva Hyman herself. I think that people across the world fell in love with Eva. They felt like they could relate to her. Um, and that's a big reason why it became a success. Of course, the way that we did it, that it was very uh, new and it was very uh, different the way that we did it on Instagram, you know, was a big portion of that. But considering what Heather said, I, I agree that it has a lot to do with the character. Mm -hmm. And I think in my case too, is because I chose to write this um, in, in a fictionalized sense. And so I was using dialogue and conversations. And these were, by the way, were words that Lully used with me. And so it wasn't um, a memoir and it wasn't written in that kind of framework. It was written as this is this man. And 
I didn't know how to write a book. I'd never written a book before. And I was lucky I had publishers who said, just tell the story. And so I said, well, I can only tell it in the words that Lully told me. And I think from what I understand, that is also what people connect to is the simple language and simple descriptions as seen through those one person's eyes, just like Eva. By the way, congratulations, guys. Amazing. Loved it. <laughs> Lali uh, Sokolov from Auschwitz. Uh, Lali was uh, sort of, uh, I would say, lucky, very very big quotation marks to be selected to do a certain job that gave him benefits he was very ingenious he had like really um activities that were not um um common to anybody he knew to form relationship with polish people who worked in auschwitz with uh, german uh, uh soldiers he was really unique i think in his way of finding solutions to problems and eva is the opposite eva is a child totally um you know um caught by 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 the by her destiny without ability to do anything she's just uh you know have to sort of uh, move on and it's very very moving when you see it uh yet both of these characters the one that has succeeded to really manipulate uh his circumstances in order to survive and the young girl who actually was um not able to affect her destiny and therefore maybe that's the reason she couldn't survive are very very different and yet both of them um, succeed to touch millions couldn't agree more um, great uh, summation of the two differences you know every holocaust survivor i've met and i've been lucky to meet you know, hundreds of them because australia had i think outside of israel about the second largest number of holocaust survivors came down here and i've met many of them Every one of them used that word lucky to describe their survival, every single one, including the, the lovely ladies who I am currently involved with in Tel Aviv, survivors. Again, they all use that word lucky. Yeah, Lali had something else going for him. He was a, an opportunist. He was a manipulator. He had that going for him. It still didn't guarantee he was going to survive, but he did have that degree of what we would call savvy he was able to look for opportunities and and when they came he took them uh, so yes there is a difference and but it isn't the other main difference that he survived and eva didn't mm -hmm. yeah yeah I, I think the uh, when we told the story of eva and and, and my and i came to it from different directions so we are not one voice in this uh, um, and which made the journey much more interesting for me as a father uh, and was much more problematic for Maya as a daughter. <laughs> <laughs> why? Because you had to say, the final say or why? <laughs> no, 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 I did not. I did not. At, no, one no. Point, at one point, we said, how do we overcome our disagreements? And we said that we need to really develop our ability to convince each other so it's not just saying, no, this is better. Why is it better? Convince me why is it better? And that dialogue was amazing. And, uh, and while I was uh, finding Eva, I was also finding Maya. Wow. wow. And, and, my, and Maya, like my other daughter, we are extremely close. Like, I didn't think that I'm gonna find, I didn't think there's anything new to find. But that journey was really amazing. And at one point I almost, so Eva better because I saw her through Maya's eyes as a girl mm. and as someone who's young. And, and that was a very, very uh, powerful. But I wanted to show the Holocaust the way I see it. Um, you've been captured with a family in the worst moment in history and you just can't escape it. It doesn't matter what you're going to do, you're not going to escape it. And only few will escape it. Those who really have strong genes and can survive the extremely difficult situation, really impossible. They have strong genes, they have strong personalities, but there must be something very strong about them. Physically, not only mentally, but also physically. But most of the people were caught over there 
could not escape it. Eva could not escape the circumstances of history. No. There was no way. And one of the uh, things that were important for us in the storytelling, which is very different from the, you are the hero. You told the story of a hero. We actually told the story of an anti-hero. Yeah. And, 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 and one of the, one of the things that we quite insisted in the movie, and my and I uh, had about it a lot of discussion, but it was more complicated for me because I grew up in Israel. So I saw the Holocaust from the Israeli side. Maya grew up in America. And so she saw the Holocaust from a different perspective. And, and I, as a child in Israel, every time I remember that I see movies about Nazis and, and, and the Holocaust, they were screaming, they were shouting. And over here, most of the movie was quiet. Mm. And, and, and that was a decision that we've made because you don't have to shout when you have weapons and tanks and dogs and all the power in the world, and in front of you, there is a weak family, starving, cold, fearful, and understand what the destination is. So one of the things that we wanted to create over there is, is, is really a, a, to show how you cannot escape. We were talking about people who cannot escape. You have to be very unique to escape such powers. And we wanted to show this wonderful family, which is like each one of us, and how you cannot escape. And it was a great, and I knew that we were doing it the right way because uh, uh, we have a friend who is a commander in the Israeli SEALs, which is the toughest unit in the Israeli military. And he told me that after he saw Eva, he understood that if he had a child who was five years old and another child who was 10 years old, and he was in Europe those days, he, the warrior, the soldier, the, the, the SEALs, the guys who've done the toughest training and the toughest military operation in his life, he would do nothing, just hold his family and say, how can I die with them in the, most, in the less painful way for them? And, 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 and that's actually what we wanted to show. We wanted to show that how, how you cannot escape from history. So I think we have over here great two stories. One who escapes from history, and one was unable to escape of history. And I think that we were all lucky. We are great. We were, we were, we were telling the stories very, really good. In a very <laughs> good way. Yeah. Can I say, by the way, Lali would never, ever consider himself a hero. I mean, you know, I, I do and other people do, but he hated that. He would not be uh, allowed to be called that because he didn't. He said, no, I was just lucky, lucky, lucky. I survived. But um, yeah, yeah, he did manipulate it as best he could. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I want to also share with you something that uh, Heather shared with me uh, earlier um, before you, we started this broadcast. Uh, Heather, can you please share with us um, how your story about the Holocaust resonates now uh, in the Corona crisis? Uh, look, I have been just humbled by the thousands of emails that I've been getting ever since the book came out from all around the world. But it seems to have intensified in the last three or four weeks. And people are now writing to me, talking about their situation quite right now and relating to Lali and Gita and saying how they're taking hope from having read their story. And one young man in particular who wrote to me about 10 days ago, a 20 year old a young man living in Milan in Italy and he told me he's living in an apartment building where every day his friends his neighbors and members of his family have been dying for weeks and he has been locked inside and he was in despair his 13 year old sister gave him the tattooist of Auschwitz and said read this he read it he said and never went to bed finished it in a day and a bit and then had to write and tell me that he now knows he will go on, he will survive, he will do everything he can, and he will try and have the best life he can because he has taken hope and inspiration from those people in the Holocaust. 20 year old young man in lockdown in Milan. 
one of the worst hit cities in the world for COVID-19. Just so powerful. And this is one of so many I'm getting right now. Heather, I apologize for the non-politically correct question, but I live in Israel, so we don't have anything. We're just politically correct. <laughs> uh, are you Jewish? No, I'm not. That's what I thought. So tell me about how, and I'll tell you why. You will know why I'm asking you this question in about two or three months. Okay. How did you manage to write, how did you feel about writing a story which is so Jewish and not being Jewish? Was it well, firstly, yeah. Where, where, where you're afraid that you're going to be... Um, Hung, drawn and quartered? Yeah. <laughs> The reason why I wrote it was because Lully insisted on talking to somebody who was not Jewish. Uh, his son had tried to get him to speak to journalists and other people because he wanted to talk to somebody after his wife died. Gita had died. I need to tell somebody my story before I join her. He insisted, someone not Jewish. And his reason, because I had to ask him that first day I met him, for him, there would not be a Jewish person alive that was not touched by the Holocaust. They did not have their own baggage, he said, and that could not write his story without bringing in their own story. So that was his reason. And the fact that I had to admit my small town New Zealand education taught me so little about the Holocaust, but it made me the perfect person for him. And that also was why I wrote it the way I did, which was using his words only and the research which we did and we did uh, an incredible amount of professional uh, research was only to confirm the facts he told me not to learn from anybody else because i only wanted to tell not the story of the holocaust but a holocaust story just lollies but were you afraid were you afraid or worried that uh, that in the age of uh, uh, of political identity mm. uh, uh, Cultural appropriation, I think they call it. Yeah. Yep. Were you afraid of that? Look, I was a little bit, and I was warned by a couple of uh, people, other authors who have done not necessarily Holocaust stories, but written stories that not about their own um, culture, that it would happen. But the wonderful thing is I have spoken at Holocaust centres and synagogues from London to South Africa throughout every part of the US and Canada and every Jewish person I meet in these environments, they say to me, Lully was a wise man giving you his story. Lully knew what he was doing. Some of the criticism I have has never come from anybody of the Jewish faith. It's come <laughs> from outsiders. So at which point I go, mm, doesn't matter, doesn't count. I seem that the people who I was most worried about are the ones I turned out I could be least concerned about. Really interesting. By the way, I'll just say a remark and then my own but for the same reason it lucky chose you, we chose that all our records will not be Jewish. Okay. No. And no one in Ava was Jewish, yes. Because we said every Jew brings his own history in his own back. Yes. Yeah. Baggage. Right, baggage, right. And we wanted it to be clean. We wanted them really to find a new way to connect to the story in a way really families would have. And, and I think that's one of the things that made it very, uh, uh, very strong. That is oh, absolutely. And, 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 that's, and that's something which is very common in the stories. And by the way, I knew that you're not Jewish. I was just asking it for the discussion. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but, well, I think, but I think that one of the, one of the successes that we had yeah. is that you're you wrote it and we brought non-Jewish actors and I think that's something that I found out which is common in apparently in what we've done here. Oh, look, it's lovely to hear that you say that because um, I'm just proud of what I've done and I'm so proud that Lully took the, had the courage to share his story and allow me to tell it. Now he, he died of course before the book came out but I wrote this as a screenplay initially and he read many drafts of the screenplay and he totally approved of how I was telling his story because he wanted to reach an audience beyond survivors of the Holocaust and their families. Right. Well, and and you, mentioned, you mentioned three million sales. Can I tell you that the book actually, in English speaking 
uh, language, which is really only at the US, the UK, Australia, South Africa, a few, over 5 million copies are now sold. Wow. If you take 5 million copies and you say for every one, they say roughly four or five people will read it. And now that's not including the fact that it's actually in 55 countries with 47 translations. And um, those figures are just coming through to me now of uh, those other translations. So it's having an incredible reach and all of it is just so goddamn positive. Right. I lo it's wonderful. Nice. I actually want to come and make two comments here. First, I'm actually fascinated by this observation because only from you, you know, when I was thinking to myself, what is really the source of success? It's sort of like now, look to me, we have only, of course, two cases. So, you know, in my original discipline, it's not enough to make um, a, a rule, but uh, it's, I think it's very moving because what you're saying is that in order for really the whole world to relate to the story of the Jews in the Holocaust, the people who should sell it tell it are non-Jews. I think it's fascinating that... Uh, I can give you, you know, a third, I, here's a third example, because I've sat in, um, in a conversation with this particular man, and uh, his name is Thomas Keneally. He is 85, 86 years old now, he lives in Sydney, um, about an yeah, hour and a half flight away from me, and he wrote Schindler's Ark. Yeah. And he also is not Jewish. Yeah. Now I know that Mr. Spielberg, who made the film and made that so famous he is, but it came from Tom Keneally, another Aussie, another non-Jewish gentleman. Right. But there's three. Mm -hmm. By the way, you mentioned uh, uh, that this uh, woman from, uh, this person from uh, Milan, and so you know, uh, you on the back of your, uh, on the wall, you have a picture of uh, Napoleon. Yes. And the horse, uh, it's a picture when he was crossing the Alps of France to Italy, mm -hmm. uh, to conquer Italy, so, uh, done by uh, Jean David Louis, I think, but, uh, but, 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 but uh, so I just said it was an issue, so he, he never knew there's a corona there, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, I think what do you think made our story successful? I think what's interesting about what you guys just said, I agree that, um, that in many cases a non-Jewish person can successfully tell the story of the Jews the way you did, Heather, um, I think what's beautiful also is that you actually got the approval of the person whose story it was. You were able to get that approval from Lottie, and that's a beautiful thing. Um, yeah. I think that's something that I wish I had, <laughs> you know? I <laughs> wish that I was able to get Eva Hyman's approval. Um, and it's interesting the kind of different, probably the different uh, sort of things that we had to go through, you versus us, and telling someone else's story. And in a way you kind of, I don't know how you felt Heather, but in a way you kind of have to um, become that person a little bit. You have to try to become that person as much as you can so that you can tell the story as authentically as possible. Um, and that's what we spent so many months doing to the point that we would dream about Eva Hyman mm. every night and she would find us in, in every place in our lives. Um, but I just think it's beautiful that, that you were actually able to get the confirmation that you told it the way um, that he wanted it to be told. Yeah. Look, I spent a lot of time with him. as He became a very, very close personal friend to me and my whole family. And because I spent so much time with him, and there was a period of spending these hours of hearing of all this you know, tragedy and the evil, horrible evil that he witnessed and experienced, that a lot of that pain actually did transfer over to me. Mm. I went through a period of actually struggling to be with him because I was couldn't be with him knowing the kind of pain and trauma. And yeah, guilt, he had survivor guilt like every other survivor I met uh, that I had lived with. And it was interesting watching it transfer from him to me because mm. I took it on board until a friend of mine slapped me around and told me I had no right to. Mm. But when he did that, it became cathartic for him. And this, he stopped saying, I need to be with Gita. He now started reconnecting with the Jewish community in Melbourne where he'd pulled away from. And it became a release for him in telling it. And just yeah. like you, yeah, it comes into you and became part of me. Yeah. Yeah, but the, the, the reason I'm asking you about it is because your story was a very non-conformist story about the Holocaust, right? Because you are saying there was love in Auschwitz. 
Yeah. And I, when, I read, when I read the book, I said, wow, she's really brave. Not being Jew and saying there was love in Auschwitz. How dare she? <laughs> Can I and, tell you, I have met other people around the world who have said to me, my mum and dad also met in Auschwitz. Really? Uh, this is a so, community. That was a community of sorts. And, and, and yeah, and, and I thought that this was, I admired your intellectual braveness to do it because I, because I said, if I would write a story, and, and, and by the way, I'm saying it out of admiration. If I read it, if I had a story about something that doesn't belong to my nation, which the story is going to be contradicting so many, mm -hmm. so many uh, 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 conceptions or so many uh, 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 foundations, foundations yeah. and knowledge and, and come and say a love affair near the crematorium? How can you love? You know, I spoke with Ella about it and I told her, uh, uh, how can you love when you are hungry? When you're really hungry, how can you love? When you're totally afraid, how can you love? And how can you fall in love? And, 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 and that was, in my view, a very powerful decision on, 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 on your hand. Okay, here's a little um, side story. I wrote the, the screenplay, I had a draft of it, and I gave it to Lali one day. It was his birthday, and I was sitting in his um, dining room, and I, his son, who was a man in his mid-40s, late 40s at the time, he was there. And I gave Lali the, the script, and he opened it up, and he's flicking through the pages and running his hand over his and Gita's name, and really, really excited. And then his son took it off him and said, let me have a look at it. And he took it off and he was reading it, Lali and I are chatting. And then his son said to me, there's a scene in here you have to take out. I can't have anything in my parents' story that's not true. And I said, okay, fine, show me the scene and um, I'll take it out. He showed it to me, I started reading it, showed it to Lali. Lali starts reading the scene and his head starts going down. And I said, Lali, is it true? And he shook his head, yes. And I said, Lali, do you want me to take it out? And he shook his head, no. Well, his son stood up and smacked him over the head. And he said to him, how could you? How could you sleep with my mother before you were married? Oh. <laughs> he was reading about his parents being intimate in a death camp. And Lali's sitting there saying, it is true. And this poor man in his uh, mid to late 40s, it was all too much for him. Right. He, he changed so, so the coffee I for something stronger. Right, so my lolly in this point of view were two things, were Maya, because I, and, and, Eva's, and Eva's book. But, uh, but uh, I was, uh, for me, Eva, 13 years old girl, is very, mm -hmm. it's a big distance. Oh, yeah. And so for me in the middle, I had Maya as my daughter, that we had really discussions. Yeah. First we discussion, what did Eva feel about? And, and how, and, 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 and as a girl. And, and, and the second thing was, uh, when we were shooting the movie, and we, so, so when, we, we, when we read the diary, we both came from different direction. Mike came from the personal, emotional direction. I came from the historical point of view. So okay. everything has to be accurate. So we, and, and, and so we created, we took the diary and we created the diary in, in a city. So everything that basically we think that Eva saw, we created it. And then the next discussion was, it's, a big, it's, it's the only film maybe in the world in that size that was done from a phone. I know. Now right. there's bravery, folks. That's bravery, what you two did. Right. <laughs> Reducing <laughs> and, it and telling it in this way. Fantastic. And, and then the biggest discussion with my night all the time is where would she direct the phone if she was there? Uh -huh. and, and then I would say, and you know, and we had, we had scenes that there were about two, 300 people on the scene. And I would say to Maya, she would direct it over there. And she said, yes, she would if she was a boy. <laughs> if she's a girl, she would direct it over there. 
yeah. and 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 so 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 it was it was like an amazing discussion and uh, and uh, and uh, doing it from the phone that way we really need to understand one is whatever we saw and where would she put the phone to which direction and uh, and it always goes back to something that i always was asking myself there's a famous picture of the little boy in the holocaust in ghetto Warsaw, which is raising his hands if uh, in the not right and we see him with his couple with his mother and a couple of other people and i was always asking myself what did he see because yeah. we have the picture of him but what did he see because what he saw was terrifying he saw people with a gun towards their them what he saw was a nightmare. And over here, what we try to say is, okay, what is, what does the have a seen? And, and, and there was an amazing discussion. I don't know if, even if you remember uh, uh, that, that I told Maya, the big thing is happening over here. But she said, yeah, but she would be fearful. You would, she would look over here. And like, like, so we're trying actually to see where would she turn her head? Because this is not a project of a camera that looks at everything and the storyteller who knows everything. We are not the storytellers who knew everything. We were the storyteller who knew nothing. We were Eva. Eva never understood. It took Eva. We, we explore the story the way Eva explored the story. She never knew that the end is going to be death. No. And together with her, we were walking the same, the, the, the same, the same direction. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and that's what creates, uh, I think, the authenticity. Yeah. yeah. I think the collaboration between both of you is, um, I think, um, was a must, I think, for the success of this project. Because uh, when I saw, uh, I, there are two comments I wanted to make about um, uh, Eva's story after I saw it again today, this morning, like really, really uh, focused. and. Two things that I want to sort of uh, put up and also maybe relate it later to Lali. Um, one is that first I thought you did a marvelous job and I, I probably uh, should thank Maya uh, to project the spirit of a young girl because uh, I could really relate. I remember, you know, if one thing I really, when I look at my personal life and I remember fondly and I wish I could repeat is this, um, um, uh, this joy, this uh, what, what, uh, how do you say it? Like the joy of life that uh, you have when you're 13 year old and you want to dance all the time, and you all the time can. And I remember me and my friends dancing when we were 13 year old, and then you are doing the exact same thing for this girl. So I thought it was totally cool, and you know, made me think about this is actually something that is very, very girly. Uh, it happens all over the world. I, I imagine that also for girls in that time as well. I loved it. Um, and uh, it also made me like really remember my personal childhood and I was like, oh my God, it was so wonderful. And then when you think about it, you ask yourself, oh my God, these Nazis, you know, how could they stop that? It's like so cruel to do it. Uh, so this is one thing that I think really projected really was, uh, maybe this is one of the like things that really made uh, children relate, uh, young girls. But also uh, another thing that I wanted to ask you about is the clothes. Uh, all the clothes in the, that they, they wear there are very, very different than what yeah. you normally see in Holocaust movies. Like, they never have the same colors. Uh, yeah. they, they do have the cer certain style, but you know, all these hearts uh, in like red and all this uh, pink and this thing, you never see that in movies. And I actually never asked myself, mm -hmm. what was the real deal? I don't know what was actually happening. So what was your research? Why did you do it? Did you make a change or did you want to relate it to our days? What's the story? It was, it was really important for us to change the narrative of how people often see Jews in the Holocaust, which um, many times if you ask people who aren't Jewish, there's this kind of like um, sad, it's a kind of like sad Jew uh, narrative where the Jews look the same and everything is dirty and uh, the colors are very muted. Actually, when we got to um, pre-shooting, uh, when we got to Kiev um, and we were pre-shooting and we were looking at the outfits, I came in and there was a huge room of outfits um, and our costume team was amazing, but when I first came in, they showed me the rack, 
and the rack was all browns and beiges and black. And I asked them, oh, like, but we're doing a movie about a young girl, like a, a young, beautiful girl. Where, where are the, like, where are the colors? And the, I looked around and all across the room were colors, but none of them were for Eva or for Annie, her best friend. Um, and there was a big mis misconception as to how we should show them. Um, there's almost like this feeling because it's such a difficult topic, we want to put them in muted colors, but it's just not reality. There were a lot of people living back then um, in beautiful clothing that had beautiful homes, that had beautiful families. And we really wanted to show the amount of things that were lost, not just, um, not just actual families, but also the amount of beauty that was lost. Um, you know, the amount of things in the home that were lost. Um, and so it was a very, uh, it was a very um, assertive decision that we wanted to make, that we wanted to make sure that Eva looked like a young, beautiful, stylish um, girl. Well done. Absolutely um, right. I think we've just been looking at too many black and white photos of the time and just extrapolating from that, that there was no colour, which is just ludicrous if you think about it. It's absurd to think that they didn't have colour. So, mm -hmm. yes, congratulations. Yeah, Heather, okay, I think so you used to seeing you it in black and white. What? Sorry, we were talking to No, people. I was agreeing that it's, it's true. We're so used to seeing it in black and white, and that might be also one of the reasons why. Mm -hmm. Heather, you want to say, I think we're going to uh, uh, close soon. I just want to say one comment. I actually have, like, I'm trying to bounce between the Facebook page and here, so I want to say a comment uh, given to us by here, Chava Pfizer, who said that she went to uh, elementary school in the Reali in Haifa, and uh, the days of the memorial of the Holocaust were very, very meaningful um, all around all, all the years that she was in school, uh, and many of them were the children of the Holocaust survivors, but we never talked about it. Um, we never talked about it, we never shared, so this is a comment that she made. Mm. So I would not be surprised that, you know, this uh, um, lengthy uh, sharing of, of, of stories is probably something that uh, makes them feel uh, um, some sort of relief. Uh, I, for the Facebook page, some people, I just going to say that people said it's very interesting, but now I lost my Facebook page, so now I'm with you in the web webinar, <laughs> so I'm sorry, it's like I'm, I'm very novice here. Okay, Heather, would you like to say also about your like last, let's do last thing and then we'll finish because I think just attention span in uh, Facebook is not like for very long. Uh, so would yeah. you like just to share your perspective of how you revived um, you know, you were in the same, both of, all, all three of you were in the same business of reviving an era that is no longer exists. And uh, Mati and uh, Maya shared with us all their decisions and, you know, their props and their, uh, and the houses. And they had a lot of things to work visually. And for you, you had only words, but words are very powerful. So can you please share with us your choice of words, how you chose to work around to project the reality that is now lost? Well, I, I use Lali's words. Uh, that's as simple as that. <clears throat> now, where Gita is concerned, let me just say that I know that we're, we're losing these stories at one level because Holocaust survivors are fewer and fewer. But we really do need to give thanks to Steven Spielberg for forming the Shoah Foundation and sending videographers out there and recording, I believe, some 50 plus thousand testimonies of survivors. Uh, Lali and Gita both made uh, testimonies and it was watching Gita for two hours, her videotape that enabled me to get a, a little bit of an understanding of this, this woman, um, but mostly it came from Lali. Now, so many people I have met who said, my mum, my dad, my grandma and grandfather, they were survivors and they won't talk to me. They will not share their story. How can I make them? My simple um, answer is you can't. The only thing I can offer is that you try and find somebody like Lully did, somebody who's not emotionally connected to your family, and see if they will talk to them. Can I tell you, I've heard from many, many people who I have suggested that to in many countries, and they have done that. And for many, it's actually worked. They have found an independent, um, emotionally uh, disconnected person, and they're now hearing these stories. 
Interesting. It's a matter of you know, getting them told and telling them in a way that people want to hear and read them. Now, one of the criticisms I got when the book, before it was even released, and we gave it to a, well, he was an academic in Holocaust studies, and we said, can you please read this and comment on it? And he commented that he could not support the book because I did not have enough of the horror in it. Oh my God. And that was when I asked to write back to him and said, that's your job. You're <laughs> the academic, you're the historian, you write the horror, I'm writing about the love. And I'm telling a Holocaust story, not the Holocaust story. And um, well, how many books now have there come out? The, the uh, Holocaust, the Auschwitz librarian, the Auschwitz pharmacist, and it has spawned a little bit of a subgenre here. But that's okay. You can't have too many. And yeah, you, know, you guys stick around, and I'm going to give you another one in about a year's time too. <laughs> yeah, we are about working three. on the translation of Silka. Uh, who is going well, to Silke, yes, yeah, that's a different story again, because it's not only the Holocaust, but she was a young girl who had to survive a Siberian gulag. Um, yes, she had the double whammy, but the, the next story the, that will complete this trilogy it involves these three young girls who then spent all their life in Tel Aviv, the two of whom are still alive. They're 94 and 96 years of age. I visit them when I can, and I will tell their story. And I think you will be as impressed with the survival of these young girls. They were 15, 17, and 19. Three wow. sisters. All survived. And they also were from Slovakia and survived in Auschwitz-Birkenau from April 1942 until January 1945. Wow. Amazing. Wow. Amazing. And, and it is an amazing story. story. And then they became freedom fighters in <laughs> Palestine, didn't they? <laughs> Yeah, you, we can see how you relate to the people you are telling the story. You become a real family member, I think, from being the, you know, the non-Jew, the farthest ever. You become a <laughs> family member at the end. Uh, yeah, I do, actually. It also happened to Maya and uh, Mati, who, who think, I think they think that, uh, I'm pretty sure that Mati thinks that uh, Eva is his uh, and a third daughter. Uh, I would not be surprised. <laughs> Um, anyway, I, Matthew froze. I, don't, I hope they can see us. Um, okay, last, um, now we are going to say, uh, we are going to part, but I, I would just uh, suggest that each one of you will say just what you hope, you know, uh, for the next, um, for a world where, to, where, is it, where is it going and how we can use all this work in order to improve it and, you know, to make sure that things will not happen and so on, all these things that we are all so care about. So. Would you like to say? Last, last, this is last question, I promise. <laughs> um, for me, I think it's, I think it's beautiful um, that we feel more brave to tell each other stories. I think it's the only way we can really connect to each other. I think it's easy to come in and, and ask, why are we touching other people's histories? Why are we touching other people's stories? But it's the only way that we can really connect to one another at the end of the day we're we're all the same and so um i just think the more ways we can tell these stories not only the holocaust but many other tragedies across communities um the more different ways we can do it the more fresh ways that we can do it the more ways that we can do it in uh young people's language and on their platforms the way they speak um the more we can really be connected to one another the, for me, Eva is uh, the beginning of a discussion. When you watch it, the next question you have to ask is, how actually did it happen? Why, what were the things that made it happen? And, and Eva needs to bring eventually that discussion because this is a discussion about the future of human and 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 this is this is a very important question because for me the holocaust is an unbearable example of what people can do to people mm. it's unbelievable what people can do to people 
and and um, and if you give the wrong people if you give the bad people power if you give them uh, capabilities if you give them influence what our life can turn into and 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 now every day something really bad happens around the world, but there is something about the Holocaust because of the totality, the military power, the functionality, the, 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 the permission that the guys who are gonna control history are gonna be the evil guys, the bad guys. The, the, the people of hatred became the people who controlled history at that moment. The world gave them the power to control history. And when that happens, all those stories that we see, like Eva and others, are, are happening because of that. So for me, uh, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, a, a, a very important discussion. That is one of the reasons why we put it on uh, Instagram, because we call it the democratization of history. We want everyone to have access to it. Mm. Uh, uh, we didn't put it on Netflix and we didn't put it on, on Amazon and we didn't put it on, on Apple. If you have to pay money, it's there. And you watch it the way you watch your life today. And that's democratization. We, as a, as a group, we decided that we're going to do another nine stories about, in the perspective of kids, in unique moments in history, from their point of view, based on real story. And, and so it's gonna be a body of 10 movies. We already finished the second one. And we're just planning when to air it because it was supposed to be aired already, but because of the corona, we postponed it. And all of it is part of our concept of 10 stories about, about based on democratization of history. They're gonna be available for everyone. You don't have to go and look for it. It's gonna be on the platform, you are there. And we don't care if people like the platforms or don't like the platforms. We want the kids to like to be there. And then we'll be able to ask significant questions. That's amazing. Yeah. And look, and talk about timely. Here we are globally facing an unseen enemy. I mean, this pandemic, if nothing else, can it just pull us together a little bit as communities and as humanity? Because we all have now, for the first time in over a hundred years, the same enemy. It, it's not showing any fear or favor to anybody. Uh, you said you're not putting your your story out right now. My my current book, which is a little being released on my uh, on a website shortly, it's actually called Stories of Hope, and it's written as a nonfiction book by me, because it talks about all these amazing people, not just from the Holocaust, but from all manner of tragic and traumatic experiences who have shared their stories of hope and what I have taken from it and how I've been able to take those and now share them myself through this book that's coming out and on a website where we are inviting people right to this website. Give us your story of hope. My publishers in London will help you edit it to make it into this uh, short story and we will now put it out there for anyone and everyone to read. So we're trying to take this time. Well, mind you, we planned this before any pandemic, so we always had planned this. But um, whatever platform works, you take it. Because otherwise, uh, I have grandchildren and the thought of them even having anything horrific come along, like not even like the Holocaust, that surely will never happen again, but anything like that, we have to, I've got to protect them. And this is my way of doing it, by, by making stories of hope. And your way is by getting through to the young people through the only medium they really, really approach. And gosh, I'm so proud to have spent this time with you. And, um, you. and, Thank you. and I honor you for what you're doing. Thank you very much. I'm honored as well. I'm delighted to have this conversation. I think it's so important. And I can tell you, I'm going to summarize our broadcast with one of my personal insights that I feel that especially now in the Corona crisis, we understand the power of the world and the power of content and how important it is to people. Uh, people once said they started to be quarantined, the two things they consumed was food and content. 
and it's important for us to take that and make sure that you know the 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 content that will lead us to a better future would rule and not uh, you know the bad guys. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye -bye. Absolute thank pleasure. You. Great. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.